My name is uh, Ira Cohen. I'm the chief data scientist for a company called Anadot. Uh, we're a, a, a seven-year-old uh, startup in Anana uh, dealing with uh, basically monitoring. You'll, see, you'll hear all about what we do in the context of the machine learning that we do. And um, um, today I'm going to talk about the story behind how we created the product uh, that is uh, the basis of Anadot. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about algorithms really, uh, unless you want me to drill into anything I can. Uh, more talking about the process of how we created a product that is based on machine learning at the, at the core of it. And uh, what does it take? And uh, you know, at least from my experience. All right. Let's see. This is working. No. Yes. No. Not really. Okay. Now it's now it's uh, just Microsoft. All right. So basically, um, the big story. A lot of companies are pushing more and more machine learning. I mean, you're here probably because you want to to learn it as well, out of interest. But also, the the industry is moving there. And a lot of a lot of bigger and bigger companies, even traditional ones that never uh, did anything around machine learning and AI, as marketing likes to call it, uh, are investing a lot of money in it, uh, and both in people and in, in software and in hardware and in everything around it. But the truth is that uh, most of the most of the activities around it, whether it's a product or uh, some capabilities that people are trying to build in the companies, don't progress beyond experiments. So 88% don't progress, at least this is from, uh, I think, a year ago. But the ones that are successful, that are able to, to get to, to do things right, are seeing you know, the benefit. At, at the end of the day, businesses don't do it for research and for fun. They do it for, for better uh, margins or profit margins. So those that are successful at doing it are getting the, the benefit out of it, at least according to, to some of these industry uh, um, surveys. So, so but, but why so many things fail? Why do they fail? These projects, or products, people trying to build products that are based on machine learning. So there are four main categories of, of reasons of failures. The first one is, you know, they try to apply, it's a hype. Everybody's saying machine learning, AI, AI, machine learning. You know, we have data, let's use machine learning. Let's solve the world problems with machine learning. But turns out the problem is not a good fit for machine learning. And oftentimes, uh, um, oftentimes that happens a lot. Actually, a lot of times it happens. The second one, which I think is probably the most uh, uh, acute one, is that, you know, again, a big hype, let's do it with machine learning, let's run, 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 but nobody thinks about what are the re actual requirements. How do you measure that it's successful, that it's doing, that it's giving the benefit that you think it's going to give. Now that it's successful in classification or in the, the, the data science success of it, but in the, business side or the, the product side of what it's supposed to do. And most of the projects fail there. <coughs> then, yeah. It, it's uh, even requirements. Well, success criteria can be KPI. It can be softer than a KPI, but still, yeah, sometimes you don't put a KPI on the success. As data scientists, we put a KPI on the success, which is accuracy or you know some other measure of uh, of goodness of what we output is great, but then it may it may not matter uh, that it's great because um, it gives no benefit. I mean, you could have uh, we we deal with forecasting. We can have we, we can come to a company and say we can forecast the future of I don't know something for you that your revenue with ninety nine percent accuracy. Sounds great, but doesn't matter. I mean, if, you, if today you, pro, you forecast with 90% accuracy with some manual process, is this 9% relevant? Does it give you any benefit? And a lot of times people don't think about that. Um, and, and, and 
I'll give a very simple example from forecasting. Um, uh, so forecasting often people, we have a forecasting part of our product does forecasting as well. And, uh, and we, we come to a potential customer and we ask them, okay, what do you expect this to do for you? And they say, we want this to be 90% accurate in forecasting, whatever, demand of something. And, and the, the question is, okay, why 90%? Why not 95%? Is 80% not good? Uh, is 85% not good? How do you translate this number to a benefit? And uh, in one example that we had, we, they actually said it has to pass 90%. They were very insistent without a good reason. And, you know, some cases it was better than 90%. In other types of things we forecasted, it was slightly lower. Is that bad? And after a lot of conversations, you understand this was a demand use case. So we were forecasting demand of, a pro of, some, some, uh, of something, of some product or some service. And it turns out today, they were in, before they were using us, they, were, they had a manual a, a process for forecasting. And then we compared it to that process and, and not in terms of the accuracy, but in terms of the benefit. So the benefit demand forecasting is, do, do I have enough inventory of the product? And I never, somebody wants it. So if I have too much inventory, I'm losing money because I'm, I'm storing something that I don't need to store. Um, if, I have, if I don't have enough, and somebody wants to buy that product, then I can't fulfill it and I lose the customer. So I never want to be too much inventory or too less inventory. So the, accurate, so the accuracy of the forecast doesn't matter. The question is, can I minimize the inventory and never make you lose a customer? So it's a business requirement. It's, not, it's nothing to do with the accuracy. And then when you compare it to what they do today, then you can say, okay, I can improve this by X percent whether I get 80% forecasting accuracy or 90% forecasting accuracy or 70% forecasting accuracy. I have to, I don't, that doesn't matter. I have to translate that to whether I meet, uh, whether I, I get you a benefit, a business benefit. And oftentimes this is not done at all or done very poorly in the planning phases and even in the throughout the phases. And, uh, and, and we produce great algorithms that have great performance, but then they, they, they're, they do not, they're not helpful. And then the, because at the end of the day, you know, some management looks at the numbers and they say, well, this didn't give us anything. We spent a million dollars and we got nothing uh, in terms of better revenue or better something. Uh, so, so that's, I think that's probably one of the big reasons why it fails. Then you have, uh, uh, you know, especially in large companies, they try to you know, make it very big and complex. We want to solve, we want to push AI to everything. And then they create this big project and buy a huge platform. And, you know, they spend a lot of time on that and not, not enough time on actually solving the problem that, they, that can give them a benefit. And cultural resistance, which is, you know, it's, it's going down uh, a lot of times. You know, you have people within the company that are afraid for their jobs or think this is not going to do well or can't trust uh, the machine learning to, to make it. Trusting it, that has also uh, a big impact. So this is why, why things fail. Um, now let's see what, what I'm going to talk about today is the story of Anadot from, from my perspective. Um, so what, what do we need to, to get this ML product, a base product, uh, successful product out there? How do I know? And, and I ask questions of how do I know whether machine learning is a good fit? Answering that first, avoiding the failure of the uh, uh, category. And I'll talk about, you know, what, how do I think about requirements and success criteria? And I'm going to give it all in the context of the Anodot example which is you know, a specific type of machine learning, specific type of problem. But I think this process, I mean, when you go out, and I don't know if you'll do it, but you have to think about, you know, is what I'm doing really helping the company I'm in or not? Uh, is it solving a problem? It's always fun to work on projects. It's fun to work with, this. for some people it's fun. Um, and, and you can go down and, and you know, create really cool things is it helping anybody? Is it helping where I'm working? So in academia, um, I think this is a, these are important things to think about as you do things. 
So I'm going to talk about the story of Anatol. Start from the beginning. This is me about uh, eight years ago. Uh, my background is in machine learning. I did my PhD in uh, signal processing and computer vision and uh, uh, worked a lot on machine learning, supervised learning, semi-supervised learning, unsupervised learning for time series data. And I worked uh, before we started Anadot, which is uh, in Yahoo, used to be, uh, leading a data science team. One day I get this uh, cold message on LinkedIn from uh, this guy, David. He's the, he's the other founder of Anadot and uh, the CEO today. Uh, but at the time, at the end of 2013, I didn't know him and he wanted to chat over the phone. We had a quick conversation and we met over, uh, we met over dinner and basically he told me why he wanted to, why he reached out. So David at the time was the CTO of GetTaxi um, and at GetTaxi um, uh, or Get, uh, he was, uh, uh, he helped implement a monitoring system monitoring everything around the business. What does it mean monitoring? How many people are asking for rides at any given time in every city from every type of device and application and applica version of the application and uh, version of the OS? Um, how many taxis are answering? How many rides are being taken? How many failures? How many application crashes there are? What's the latency of loading the application? How, how long are people waiting for a taxi? Uh, what's the network bandwidth for their network? How's, how are the systems working? So how's the software working? So everything, measuring everything around what's happening in the, in the business. Um, and, and they measured everything every five minutes. It was going into the central databases and then they built a lot of dashboards and reports and um, looks great. That's, what, that's how you need to monitor a business. But because all of this work was mainly manual, um, they were missing a lot of real things that were happening. And they were happening on a daily, weekly basis. For example, uh, and this is the example he, he gave me at the time, if I remember correctly. Um, they, had a, they had an issue where uh, he saw in one of the reports, he came in the morning, looked at the report uh, from the monitoring system, and he, and he noticed that in one of the cities, there was a, a, not a drop, but the rate of acquiring new users was slowing down. It wasn't as fast as before. So there was a drop in the, accelerate, in the rate of new users uh, signing up. It wasn't dropping, it was just going up slower than before. It was going on for two weeks. And so he started drilling down, okay, why is this happening? Are we doing something wrong? Is there some marketing issue? Eventually, after two days of investigations, they realized there is a problem uh, somehow. They managed to discover that for, uh, for some of the customers in that city that were subscribers to one of the, cell, cell, uh, the telco providers, uh, um, their... Uh, well, when you download the app, you register, and then you get a text message with a code. And then you enter the code in the app, and then you can start working. But the, for that telco, they changed their API for text messages, and the text messages were being rejected. So they, they had errors in sending the text messages, but nobody noticed because it's one, you know, it's some errors, there are always errors. And uh, it's for one telco, for part of only a small portion of the users, so the data was there showing that there is a spike in errors. The data was there showing that people are not being, not some people are not able to complete their registration. Um, it was there in real time, but nobody looked at it because there are like, you know, 100,000 other things to look at. And in dashboards, in manual ways, in visualizations, you can't look at everything. You can't have enough people to look at everything all the time. And this incident cost them tens of thousands of dollars. Not, not, it wasn't small. It lasted for two weeks, took a few more days to figure out and fix. And according to him, and I, I knew it also from, from my experience at HP, the, this happens a lot. This happens a lot and it costs a lot of money. And the reason for it is not data. So data is solved. Collecting the data was solved in real time or near real time. 
The problem is you can't have enough eyeballs to look at all this data to figure out that something is happening, something abnormal is happening. Uh, so he, he, he understood there is probably, realized there is a solution using machine learning algorithms that can look at all the data all the time, all this monitoring data. Uh, he couldn't find a product that he can buy, or he tried some open sources that do anomaly detection. They were not good. They produced a lot of, and we'll talk about it, what the requirements from a product like this are. Um, and he, he, he found me on, uh, with friends and LinkedIn and said, I have an idea for a company. I think this can be solved. I said, yes, this can be solved with machine learning. I know it. I, I've seen algorithms worked on algorithms related to that. And uh, six months later, we started how they, um, the idea uh, came about from a real need um, uh, in real companies. So I mentioned uh, the first question, you know, so somebody comes to you and says, solve this with machine learning. How do you know? So my first answer is, let me, let me think about it. Because if you can solve a problem without machine learning, solve it without machine learning. There's no reason to solve it, to, to add the complication of uh, uh, machine learning with all the uncertainty, the inaccuracies, the dependencies on data uh, to a problem that you can solve without. If you can solve it deterministically, solve it deterministically. Uh, there is no reason for this complication. Um, so. I usually ask myself three questions to, to, to understand whether the problem should be solved, can be solved, is it a good fit at all to, machine, to solve it with learning. And basically the question is, do we need better scale? Is there a problem of manual method or some, uh, the existing uh, method or some deterministic method? And uh, the second question, accuracy? compared to today, because again, machine learning can potentially, by looking at a lot of data, produce better. Don't know it from the, at least it has the potential. Scale for sure. And then speed. So scale means I have to make lots of decisions. Uh, accuracy is accuracy. And speed meaning I have to make very fast decisions. So for example, came and said, can you use machine learning to detect cancer in MRI images? Sure, I can, but let's see what, 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 can, what can machine learning bring to the table and improve? So do I need better speed? In this case, no, better speed. I mean, the fact, if I can do, if I can make a determination in 10 milliseconds or in one day, really doesn't matter to, for the outcome of the patient uh, in almost all cases. So. Speed is not relevant for this problem. Accuracy, maybe, maybe it's relevant, but you know, humans, I would ask a question, how well do doctors detect? What's their accuracy rate? Uh, do we really need to be more accurate than that? Uh, scale is, a, is for sure a problem there because you have a limited experts that can look at these MRIs and you might want to have a lot more people taking MRIs and then the scalability becomes an issue. Uh, so, so for sure in that problem, scale would be an issue. If I'm talking about uh, um, an ad tech company that has to decide whether to bid on a use on, on an ad space on some, on some, uh, uh, in a game or in a website, when a user comes in, then the question of speed is the most critical one because there the decision has to be made in so they can't have a human in the loop at all. Scale is there as well. You have huge, uh, huge scale because lots of people go on and there's lots of uh, ads being displayed all the time. Uh, and, and accuracy, I mean, it's irrelevant at that point. It's irrelevant, but if I compare it to deterministic method, probably accuracy becomes important because the deterministic methods tend to have, you have a potential of lifting the accuracy compared to the rule-based systems that people put for deciding whether to bid on ads or not bid on ads. So these are two examples. In my example of the business monitoring, well, all of them are yes. Scale is an issue. I, the, the, the example I gave from David is one great example. Lots of data and you don't have enough people, you don't have enough eyeballs. You can't hire enough eyeballs to look at all this data. 
so definitely a scale issue. Lots of false positives in the way that people are doing things. So how do people, I mean, it's not like uh, they don't get alerted on issues. They create rules, static thresholds or all sorts of manual rules to decide whether something looks, something is bad or not. And those produce huge amounts of false positives. Um, and speed is also an issue because you want to detect this as quickly as possible. And, you know, we talk to potential customers as we were uh, working on uh, um, on pitching this uh, these ideas. And, um, you know, we heard a lot of times that despite having a lot of uh, monitoring tools and alerts and getting lots of false positives, uh, still, sometimes they hear issues from customers through support or through things like down detector, uh, where people basically complain. So you, you, you make your customers the alerting mechanism, that's the worst thing that you can do uh, in most cases. Right. So, so basically, we decided to create a product. Uh, and the product, uh, we called it autonomous business monitoring. And why autonomous? Because you don't have to do manual work to get it to work and to also uh, 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 view the results that you need. And, and in, that, uh, in, that, in that sense, we had three main pillars that we said we need to create this product to do these three main pillars. The first one is to detect, to detect that something's happening. So how do you detect, how do you, how do you, what algorithms do you use or what machine learning do you use to start detecting that there are issues. Um, so you could use supervised learning classifiers and try to map all potential issues, collect a lot of data about issues that can happen in a company like, uh, like Get or in a telecommunication company and collect a lot of fault data and normal and regular data and learn a classifier and make it supervised. The problem with that is that you need a lot of fault data and the faults can be, I mean, actually in the beginning of my career, when I was working at a research lab in, uh, in uh, HP, I, I tried to do this for, for networks. And I went to experts and asked, what are the 10 com most common faults? Let's build a classifier for those. Supervised is always better. Um, and it was really, really hard. I couldn't get anywhere. I could hear about five, two main faults, but there was, there was no way to collect data. And then when I looked at a lot of incidents, I realized there are a thousand ways things can fail. And, uh, and it's almost hopeless to try to collect the data for all these potential failures. So the other approach is the unsupervised approach and, and in particular, anomaly detection. So why, why anomaly, detection, anomaly detection do? Basically, anomaly detection tries to look for abnormalities in data. Uh, in our case, in monitoring data, which means time series data, things that you measure over time. And, and the reason it, it can work is because all these incidents, I mean, if everything looks normal, then there's no incident. There's nothing, there's nothing bad, unless it started bad from the beginning. But as long as you assume that most of the time you're okay, then things look abnormal, this is a potential incident. It doesn't have to be, but it's, at least it's a good potential. It's, it's a thing that you want to look, look into. Anomalies are rare, so most of the data is normal. If anomalies are not rare, they're not anomalies anymore, but they are the norm. So anomalies are rare. And uh, if you can detect them, now you can do something with it. You can alert on them. You can, you, you can at least data that you collect, you can highlight the ones that look abnormal and then potentially make a determination if those are real incidents or not. So that's the first step, the anomaly detection. The second step is to help. Okay, so you detect that there is a, but if you remember David's example, Two week, after two weeks, he realized something was happening. So he detected the issue, but it took a few more days to figure out where it's happening. So he saw a drop in the rate of new registered users. But uh, to figure out that the spike in API errors of sending text messages took a few more days looking into all the rest of the data that they got, that they, they collected. Because 
the drop could have happened because of marketing failures, because of uh, weather, because of some internal thing, external thing. You don't know why it could happen. It could be a lot of reasons for it. So helping understand faster the root cause is also uh, uh, part of the, what a monitoring system should do, should do, the ideal one. And the last step is uh, remediation. So if we can have a system that detects the problems, understand what's the potential cause of it, or at least uh, what's correlated with, with a cause, and then suggest a remediation or even automatically take a remediation, then it's a complete system. It's, uh, it's, it's really the holy grail. So this is really how we built the product uh, uh, throughout the years uh, to, to try and solve all of these, to create a complete autonomous business monitoring system. And we put some product principles around it. We wanted to be accessible to, any, to, to people that are not uh, necessarily developers, so don't have to code. We don't need to understand data science. This is not meant for a data scientist. This is meant for the, the operations or the business operations of a company. So they're not, they, they don't have to know about the algorithms, uh, turnkey solutions. So it works really fast. And of course, real time, real time, because I, if I give you, if I tell you in a week that something happened today, I'm not really helping. Well, I'm helping you maybe, but uh, not, not, not in the optimal way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a good question so um the, usually the way you you apply anomaly detection in the unsupervised sense is is you you take a bunch of data you assume most of it is normal if 30 percent of it is abnormal then you're going to think it's normal if 1% is abnormal, then you, can, then you can do something with that. So I don't have an exact number of what percentage should be normal out of the data that you use. Um, so you're not using the abnormal data. You're not tagging it as abnormal. You're not labeling it as abnormal. You just assume everything is normal or most of it is normal. And then you have to have an algorithm that can, that can learn through it. I mean, think about, I don't know, you, you probably, applied some clustering algorithms. Did you have clustering algorithms? Uh, if you run k-means, right? You're, if your cluster size is, if you have a thousand points and you get a cluster size of two, two points, that's probably not a good cluster. Um, so, but if you get a cluster size of 300 points, it looks like a good cluster. Now, I can't tell you whether that is the bad state or not bad state. I just let's tell you, well, out of these thousand, 30%, they cluster together, so they're probably a good cluster. So the assumption is that, yeah, the anomalies are, even the definition of an anomaly, that it's a rare event. Anything that, that's not a rare event is not an anomaly anymore. Um, it, 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 ha it has to be part of what's normal. Right? Uh, well, it depends on what type of remediation you're doing. I'll show an example. Oh, uh, I had a demo with an example, but uh, um, so remediation could be, uh, I can decide that the remediation is to restart the server, the database. It doesn't have to go into the code. Now, if I can get hooks into code, then I can do even potentially even better. But the remediation is involves a lot more uh, the remediation involves a lot, a lot more uh, uh, work in terms of uh, uh, machine learning. So it's not unsupervised. It has to be somewhat supervised. So first I have to know what actions are possible. So somebody has to tell me. So yeah, yeah. We haven't reached a phase where we can say, uh, I have remediations for an industry. It's still early for us, even for us, the, this part of the product, the remediation.
mediation part. Um, in, in terms of what remediation or the, the early stages, we don't need to know anything about the industry. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. No domain expert. Completely data driven. Yeah. At least the way we built it, and then, and then we add later phases, so it can work. So turnkey solution means it should work without me having to come and configure things for you because of your company or industry, uh, sending the data. So we, build it, we built it so in a way that's very agnostic to whatever source of the data. We, the product works on time series data, so things that we measure over time, but anything that you measure over time. And we have customers in gaming, and we have telcos, and we have uh, um, in printers, and then in other domains. Yeah. Uh, so it gets, uh, uh, yeah, the demo. Uh, it gets feedback. From, we we uh, we we get feedback from users in on one particular aspect of it, but they don't have to give it. So if they give it, it improves the results. If they don't give it, it still works. The idea is to make it work without without feedback. Um, Out in detection, at least on the time series. Yeah. Uh, so it has to be a time series. So it has to be something that you measure over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah I wish I had the product to open so you can see how it looks like. So. Let's separate between, so the algorithms work on anything that you measure over time, that you can plot like this time here and have measurements. Now, where the, how these measurements, their formats, their, uh, you know, how, they're, how we're getting them, we, we know how to connect to a lot of different sources, but it's not all the pot of possible sources. But as long as whatever you have can be measurements that you measure over time, some value here, revenue, number of drivers, users, then the system works out of that. Now, getting this data into the system, these are, that's not based on machine learning, that's based on all sorts of collectors. So we have collectors for logs from Splunk and CoreLogix and other sources, and we have sources from databases, and we have sources from Salesforce and sources from Google Analytics. So. Basically, you have to transform whatever that source into the format that we, that the system knows how to take. Yeah. Um, and that's also part of the turnkey solution, making sure that we can connect a lot of different sources, but it's not all sources in the world, for sure. Um, so let me skip this and go to the... Uh, uh, go to the uh, success or you know, what we realized are the success criteria translation of requirements from those success criteria. Um, so there are two main, there are other success criteria, but these are the two main success criteria that we're on. The first one is to reduce the time to detect the issues. So you have a method today, whatever it is, whether you build something or manual or dashboards or, or rule-based takes you X amount of time to detect issues, can we do it faster? If we can't do it faster, then what's the point of using us compared to some other mechanism? Um, so how do you actually, what, how does this success criteria translate to a requirement from the product that we're on, especially for me from the algorithm? So the, the requirement, the translation that I did for, for, this, for this success criteria is that we need to have an anomaly detection. It has to be accurate, and I'll talk about accuracy in a second, but also it has to work on everything, on all the performance metrics, uh, these time series that you measure, uh, on all of them. We can't, we can't limit it to a small subset of them. 
Uh, and if we want to be generic, then we can't limit it just for revenue metrics from a certain type or for a certain industry. We wanted to have it. So that was the requirement for the machine learning, having very generic algorithm that can work on any time series and, and still be accurate and work at very large scale because, um, I don't know, get taxi at the time, I think they had something like 100,000 of these measure, met, metrics, these time series that they were measuring. Facebook has 10 billion. Um, some companies have 50 million. So it has to work at all of these scale if I want to apply anomaly detection on all of them. And why do I want to apply it on all of them? You know, maybe, maybe it's okay to apply it just on a thousand because the whole point of a monitoring system, oh, well, failures can happen anywhere. If you don't apply it on everything, then you're basically looking under some lamppost somewhere that maybe is looking at just a small subset of what could happen. So if you want to catch everything, if you want to be able to understand what is happening, you have to apply it on everything. Um, if I force you to change, then it's already, already hiding some of the, you're, you're not monitoring some of the, some of what you could be monitoring. And as we said, you know, one of the problems here is scale. So machine learning can solve this. So the requirement is to work on billions of these time series and to work in near real time. They could. Uh, you mean input garbage? Where's the one? So, so choosing what to monitor. For, if we come to I don't know a company and we ask them they become a customer, they choose what to send into our system. But once they send it, we assume that everything that they send is, is important. Otherwise they won't be sending it. Uh, no, no, uh, not necessarily, but yeah, we have some pre-processing steps to try to clean things up, but it's, it's kind of uh, risky to, to, do, to do too much cleaning because that's the anomalies we're trying to look for. So it could be because the data is dirty or incorrect, and that's, that happens. And it could be because, uh, because it's a real thing. So we can't, uh, we try not to clean things out when they get pushed to us. And you were asking about feedback. Uh, so whenever we send alerts to, to potential, to, to, to somebody, they can give feedback, they can choose to give feedback. And when they say this was not good, they have three options to say why it wasn't good. And one, one of the options is the data is incorrect. So sometimes they see there is an anomaly and they go into their own database and they say, I don't see the anomaly. The data looks different here. So it means there was some problem in the transfer of the data, whether on their side, maybe on our side, uh, so that's one of the reasons it accounts for about 10% of, uh, of our bad catches. So it happens, but we have to live with it because we, on, on our side, we can't know whether this is good data or not good data. We have to assume that the data is mostly correct. Ah, with the feedbacks? Um, so three, th three th so there are three types of feedback. I mean, the, the, the bad ones are three types. One is... Uh, incorrect data. And there we have to work with a client and understand what in the data pipeline went wrong. There's no, no way around it. There was something wrong with the data pipeline. Let's figure it out. Um, because if your data is X and our data is Y, somewhere in between there, it gets lost in the translation, either on our side, their side. Usually it's on their side, but whatever. Usually these are glitches. They don't, they don't tend to last. They, they tend to happen for two hours. Some glitch happen. Um, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's a good question. If it's, uh, so, so modeling, modeling takes, 
anywhere between a day of data to four weeks of data. Uh, so usually two hours are not a big deal. And if there are anomalies in the data, so we, we have this process of discovering anomalies in the data while we model. And whenever we discover anomalies in the data, we actually give them a lower weight so they don't impact the model. So any anomaly will have some impact on the model, but uh, we give it a much lower weight. And the longer it lasts, the more it will have impact. If it lasts for a long time, then it will start actually impacting. But we then, if somebody detected that there is incorrect data and they know that they have, it's gonna take a week to fix, then, then we have a mechanism to avoid, they can click a button and say, snooze the learning and, uh, and then we don't take it into account for a whole week. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so I'll answer this in a second. We're talking about the feedback. I think I talked about incorrect data. There were two other types of feedbacks. What, that question was, what do we do with the feedbacks? Uh, the second one is, it looks like the model was wrong. It doesn't look, that's what it, this doesn't look like an anomaly, but your model said it's an anomaly. That one we take into my team and we look at those and try to something with the, is there a bug wrong with the algorithm? Do we need to improve? So that happens, we get about 2% of those are, are, are like that. And then the main category is, this is not interesting because of business context. So you show me a drop uh, of 50% in revenue from country X, but you know what? Country X is so small, I don't care. I, not worth my time to go and deal with it. So there's a business context aspect to it. And we handle automatically within the system to filter out the anomalies. So the machine learning finds all the anomalies, the anomaly detection finds all the anomalies. And then we have another, uh, another set of algorithms that try to say, okay, based on the feedbacks that we've gotten around, and this is where we let the industry come in, even the name of the company uh, to make a decision. Based on every, all the feedbacks that we got, it looks like in terms of business context, this type of an anomaly doesn't look relevant to, to this type of company or this type of use case. Uh, and then we do filtering after that. So we, we discover the anomaly, but then we decide not to send an alert on that anomaly based on that feedback. So that's most of the, most of the not good feedbacks turned out to be uh, of that nature. Things like, yeah, when you look at it with your eyes, if you don't know anything about the business, you will say this is an anomaly. This looks really bad. But then somebody says, well, it's bad. It, it, it looks bad, but it's not bad for me. Yeah. We, we do what? We're learning from, first we added it, we're talking about product progression. First we added it as manual levers. And then as we got more and more feedback, we're automating all these levers. Yeah, so in the beginning we had no feedback. Uh, so we put levers and then we see, it. we can, that's a good thing. We can see what levers were changed, how they were changed. We keep track of it and we keep track of all the feedback. So we have a lot of data today. We have around 100,000 of these feedbacks on different alerts from all the customers, which is enough data to learn a lot, to automate a lot of it. And so there are cases where, there are always cases where we need new cases, new types of not interesting business context things. Sometimes it even depends on the persona within, because one user says this is really interesting, another one says this is not really not interesting. So. We map these to use cases. We map these to who's the type of person getting that is interested in these type of anomalies. So we take all of that into account in the automation. Now to your question. Remind me what it was. Ah, failures of projects. Um, uh, let me move a little bit and we'll, I think we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, I, I'll show you an example. I'll, I won't show you, but I'll talk about an example. So, so keep me honest on this. 
All right, so we're done with one success criteria. The second success criteria is reducing the mean time to repair. So how do I help you once I detect it in real? Um, how do I help you reduce the time to repair uh, it? And here, what we, what we built is correlations of anomalies. So think about the example I gave in the beginning of David. He, I tell you there's a drop in new registered users in the rate of new registered users. If I can show you at the same time that this is correlated with an anomaly, a spike in API errors for sending text message, I don't tell you this is the cause. This, this is going to lead you to the cause much, much faster. And this is the, the correlation. Causality is, you know, I'm very careful not saying causality, even though you know, my mar our marketing wants us to say causality, but we don't do causality. Uh, causality is super, well, I think it's impossible from observations only. You have to take actions to understand causality. Um, even, even if something happens before something else, it doesn't mean it, 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 it is the cause and effect. So what, what, do we need to do, what do we need to do here? We need to, we need to build algorithms that know how to put together anomalies that are related, understand that they are related because you have anomalies all the time at any given time. Think about a, a company like Facebook. They will have anomalies in all sorts of places all the time. The fact that they happen at the same time doesn't mean they're correlated. It might be completely unrelated things. So understanding what is related to what automatically, that is the set of algorithms that we had to build. Uh, again, with no supervision, our assumption was we're not getting any, we're not getting any supervision. So nobody's telling us uh, because a lot of times people don't know uh, or won't be able to map it. And there are, the, the, from my experience, there aren't good there are, not, there are no good uh, deterministic methods of determining it. There are in some cases where if we, if we wanna know that this server is talking to another server, they're connected, you can discover this deterministically, but understanding that uh, revenues is correlated with uh, text messages to, to from an API, it's not obvious and nobody can give you that manually. And it's very hard to, to create a deterministic method so we're using clustering algorithms for determining that. So here are, here are some examples. Um, so this is, this is an example of illustrating, okay, what does it mean that you're not detecting early enough? So this is from a real uh, POC that we had. So POC, usually what we do in the POC, is they give us some historical data they know they had incidents, they know how much they, 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 those incidents cost them, and they wanna see, okay, if we had a pro, uh, this product in place, how much earlier would it uh, have, uh, have alerted us on this incident? Uh, so this is one example from, uh, you know, the number of purchases completed from some e-commerce, uh, large e-commerce, and, you know, they had an incident where, you know, the, number of purchases completed dropped, not to zero. Usually they have a rule, if it goes to zero, they can find it, but it wasn't dropping to zero, it just dropped. Uh, and you can see the measurements over time. This is when they detected it. Uh, um, and, and the orange over there, you can see where the algorithm said, this is an anomaly I could detect. So 38 hours earlier, potentially, translated to and this is the and this is what what the $226,000 now you can say this is the machine learning is giving a benefit whether it's accurate at detecting the anomaly or not who cares this is what's important customer is the company the co yeah company yeah so you just didn't tell them you no 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 so the, the, <laughs> no so this is a POC so when they, when they, a lot of times when we, when we get a potential customer coming to us, we tell them, give us historical data. You, you measure this data. You had incidents in the past. You know them. You give us the data and we'll run it through our system and we'll simulate as though it was, as though we were there and show you, okay, don't tell us those incidents. We don't need to know them, but we can detect that incident and tell you, okay, you knew, 
you, you, you detected it here because they know when they detected it. This is when we would have told you that there is an issue. In this case, it was 38 hours earlier. So, so you know, all the algorithm translation, you know, whether we're doing accuracy or not, at the end of the day, this is all that matters. So, uh, yep. Ah, what's the... Why, why, why the anomaly score is a patent? Why the algorithm for the, the method for... We're not scoring the anomalies. So usually, again, I'm not... Usually when people think about scoring anomalies, they think about how far, how deviant it is from, from normal. By the way, I didn't explain how, what this graph look like. What, what, what does this graph mean? So the solid line is the actual measurements. The shaded area is the output of the model basically saying measurement at that given point in time should be within this range based on everything that we've learned so far. So that's the, that's the visual output of the model. Um, so usually the way people score anomalies is how, how far is it from that, from that uh, baseline or from that, uh, uh, um, from that range? And the farthest it is, you can have a statistical measure saying, well, the farthest it is, the more, the higher the score, the more anomalous it is. Turns out, and this is what we thought to implement when we started the company, uh, the obvious measure. Uh, and then we saw that it doesn't correlate always, or I would say about 50%, it doesn't correlate with what people perceive as a significant anomaly. And why? Is, and so, what what we saw, what I saw when you know, interviewing all sorts of customers, is that they're not looking at it this way. It doesn't matter how much it deviates; it really matters how is this anomaly compared to past anomalies that I've seen. Is this anomaly very different from past anomalies, or is this anomaly looks similar to past anomalies? And the the more different it is, the more surprising this anomaly is compared to past anomalies the more significance they'll put to it, the more importance they'll put to it. They'll think, this, they'll, they'll believe this is more important. And that's the intuition. So if I see this type of anomaly happening 10 times in the last six months, I say, okay, it's probably not as significant as something that looks completely different from everything that happened in the past six months. So the, basically the anomaly scoring Patent is an, al an algorithm that takes that intuition and uses a Bayesian model for uh, looking at all the patterns of anomalies and all sorts of attributes of patterns of anomalies and determining the significance based on that. How surprising this anomaly is, not compared to normal, but compared to other anomalies. Yeah, yeah, it's monitoring. It's always moving forward. So how does this correlation, correlation, how does it identify, help identify root causes? For example, this is from a payment company and they're measuring payment success rate across a lot of different permutations of that. So which cards are being used, where is it being used? So they basically have tens of thousands of payment success rates that they're measuring all the time. You know, which bank is it going to or going through uh, payment gateway, all sorts of things like that. And this is how it looks like. So it's actually a number between zero and one. So one meaning all payments were successful, all payment attempts were successful. Zero means all payment attempts at that time were unsuccessful. It's interesting that normally this has variability. You would think that, you know, if I'm looking at Visa online transactions, this should be some fixed number. No completely unfixed and I don't, I still haven't gotten a good answer to why it has this pattern where at night it's much lower than during the day. And I've seen it from multiple payment companies. What? This is rate. So it's not the volume of payments. It's the successful, the, the percentage of successful payments out of the total attempts of payments. I think, yeah, so I, it, I don't think it looks, yeah. No, so this is, you try to purchase 
and the payment didn't go through. It was rejected. It could be, it could be, and at night, because there is highest risk of fraud at night, maybe, but I mean, the, but the drops are huge. What, what I've heard is, I've heard potential reasons. One of the reasons that I've heard is sometimes they push some transactions uh, that look suspicious to, to the night, and then they get rejected at night. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, it could be. Uh, there is definitely more fraud at night, so, uh, but still, it's still, for me, it's still a mystery. But anyway, they had a drop. Uh, they had a drop, abnormal drop during a time that it wasn't supposed to drop. And uh, it was happening for mainly for transactions tra done with Visa cards in that country. This was correlated with a spike in API errors to a payment gateway, uh, which was the cause. So. The correlation basically showed them, okay, this drop is correlated to this API error. Now, why this happened? Uh, and we actually also correlate with events. In this case, they actually put, they pushed uh, events around version deployments, and this was correlated with uh, version deployment of a new API. Now, it's still correlation. It doesn't, nothing in what I show you says the cause. But somebody working in this company understands that this spike and this version release is highly likely that the cause is coming from that. The cause in this success rate, highly likely that's coming from that. So the investigation, instead of going in a thousand different directions, can go into the direction of finding does this new API have a bug in it? Uh, and in, in this case, it was fixed, release, hot fix released, and things go back to normal. So that's, that's the idea of uh, how correlations help identify the root cause. Um, yeah, in terms of uh, seven minutes. So let me, let me skip that. And unfortunately, I, I don't have a demo. So just to illustrate it, you know, how does monitoring look like without machine learning doing the job? Basically, you're measuring lots and lots of things. You're getting... So you're measuring a lot of things and you might be getting some red dots somewhere. You don't know what is true, what is not true. But basically your screen is a dashboard. It looks like, you know, you're looking at everything, everything that's normal, everything that's abnormal. And you have to go in and dive into it. You know, with anomaly detection, basically I, I take away all the things that are not. Relevant. I show you only the, the correct things that you should pay attention to. But still, I don't know why this happened, uh, the correlation helps really to connect the dots and show you, okay, this is how it looks, this is the picture of this incident. And now I don't tell you this is a shark, at least our system doesn't tell you this is a shark, but you, you can, you, it makes it much easier to understand that this is a shark. Anyway, so that's the idea. That's my uh, poor man illustration of the benefit of it. Um, so yeah, we have a few minutes and uh, first let's answer the question of a, a failed project. Um, so I think most of our, uh, well, first of all, as a company, we have failures all the time. So it's okay. I mean, we have, we do more, we have less customers than POCs that we did. So for sure, some people did not want to buy the product, which means we failed in some sense. Um, so it depends how you define failure. Now, um, I would say there are two types of failures that we have, if I had to categorize them. The first type is um, what, what's there today is good enough. So the machine learning doesn't bring enough value to justify buying a product, integrating it, investing the time to, to get it to work for you, changing your workflows and and everything involved around getting. So the cost of the product or of, of getting the product is higher than the value it is going to bring. I would say, you know, in most cases, that's the reason why somebody decides not to buy it, even if they do a pilot with us. Um, because for their problem, just they, they live well enough with what they have. They decide that the value is not, the value, the, the improved value is not, doesn't, doesn't justify the cost. And 
I wish they all measured it accurately. A lot of times these are kind of gut decisions of people. They don't, it comes out of some psychology. So, uh, and, and fear that this, that they didn't have before. So I don't think 95% of the cases, we did not replace an existing system that does anomaly detection and all these capabilities, but we're replacing some system that is more manual with dashboard and uh, manual work. Uh, so, some, so, so the fear factor is also in, uh, comes into play because now you're introducing something that decides by itself all sorts of things. You don't have control over it. Even if it's better, still you don't have control. Um, so that would be probably most of the reasons why somebody doesn't take. Now, in terms of uh, uh, failures that we were not just not a good fit at all. Um, so we had a few cases. So today we sell mostly. Uh, Companies we sell to, they're mainly in the, I would call them the digital space sense that uh, uh, some sort of online presence in the, either a telco, digital companies like e commerce companies, uh, uh, enterprises, uh, fintechs. Data is flowing there at very rapid. It's lots of data and all the time. And, uh, and so their traditional ways of monitoring fails. The, the places where we tried over the years, and uh, you know, I think we stopped trying three years ago, is the, so this could be used also to monitor you know, a, a factory, a plant. Yeah, in industrial, it's called today industrial IoT, industrial internet of things. Uh, it's, it's a big push for it. It's a huge market. And, you know, it sounds relevant because monitoring is necessary. You need to collect the data. Um, and and we've did all sorts of POCs with you know, one. I, I think the, the, the most interesting one was, uh, or the most interesting for example, for, for a failure like that was a, a steel factory that we did a POC with. And in their case, you know, they produce steel and they produce these rods and they have to make sure they, they monitor actually within the ovens, the, 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 the integrity of the steel and how out and whether it's, it's they have a lot of lots and lots of sensors to make sure that the product that they produce out of the, these huge furnaces is and it's correct and they have to catch it early enough because it costs them a lot of money. Uh, so it sounds like a great use case. We actually got data, we ran it through the system, and it looked, looked like we were able to catch interesting things. The failure was because um, th they said, we need the output to be very, the people that are gonna get these alerts are people on the factory floor. They can't get graphs showing them anomalies with a baseline and all that. They need, to, they need an answer. You have a problem here in this part of the oven, and it has to be very, very tailored to their need. And we can't do that because we're generic. We were not building this product for steel factory. We were building a product for steel factory. We would make everything look for this industrial space at each factory, each type of factory wants the results to be tailored to them. And so, no, uh, well, yes, but, but if you're talking about these companies, they're used to looking at things as graphs. The people there are, the output that we can bring, they can make sense of it in terms of translating what they see to their business because we're agnostic to their business. The, the IoT space, we found they're not mature enough in the sense that, uh, you know, they have to you know, we, we were working with a chiller company with, for, for detecting problems with chillers and, and they wanted the results to look, to be on the, on the uh, show them, show, uh, have on the screen the map of the chiller and show them the component that is, that is potentially faulty. That requires a lot of product work that we were not uh, willing to do because, uh, Again, we found that uh, each one would want their own product work. So it's not like we can generalize it to, to a lot of customers. And there are other issues. 
you know, the data collection that is very premature for a lot of these companies, but even for the ones that are more mature, they wanted the output to be, to be consumed. Our output was not tailored enough for their consumption, even if it was correct. That's that's one example. Yeah, I wish I could show you the demo. We have collectors that are UI based. So that you just uh, let's say if it's a database. They don't have to have. They have to have data. If they don't have data, then yeah, we have nothing to do. But we can connect to databases to. Yeah, we can connect to a lot of different sources. I think, I don't know, we have 50 different sources. Facebook is a special customer. They, uh, they use us internally. They don't allow us anything. Yeah. yeah, so they're using our system within their environment. For most of the customers, we have two modes of the product being delivered. The most common one is a SaaS. So they, data gets sent cloud-based being sent to our system or we collect it from our system from their environment to our environment and we have an on-prem installation capability also for companies that don't want to send data out and uh, some telcos are like that some are not i mean depending on the industry but it looks like a lot of them are moving to to cloud they're not as afraid as before yeah Luckily, most of our customers are not on-prem. Yeah, we are blind. We're blind. We're... So, so we built monitoring for the on-prem installation that then the customer, we need to train them to... So if there is an issue, let's separate the success. So first of all, we have to have monitoring of the on-prem installation. So if there is a problem with that installation, the customer can understand it. And then uh, uh, the second part is, how do we know that it was successful? They can provide feedback and some of it is done automatically, but we don't see that. So what happens is we do like uh, a monthly and quarterly review and they have to tell us. That's why when we started, and actually that was another design, design decision I didn't mention. When we started, you know, I said, we have to be a SaaS product. We're machine learning based. If we can't see what's happening, then we can't improve anything. And for the first five years, it was just SaaS. And then we created on-prem. So um, I think that's an important, you know, when I was working at HP, they had products that are on-prem products and they put capability to these products. But the feedback was always very, very sparse. Oh yeah, this works nice. Yeah. But when you ask the person, you ask them to, maybe they just, we just caught something and they say it's great, and next week uh, we miss something, and they say it's really bad. This is HP. So on-prem is a problem, in my opinion, for anybody developing a machine learning algorithm, unless they have access to that on-prem to see the results. You can't know whether. Yep. 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 Um, so, so Facebook profit is one algorithm and it's one algorithm and uh, out of many, uh, in terms of, if I compare to Facebook profit specifically, first of all, in some of our code, we use Facebook, well, we have multiple, we run multiple models and have a selection of the most the most, I wouldn't say accurate, the most uh, reliable algorithm for given data set. And Facebook is there, I mean, it's open source, so there's no reason why not to let it also, try it also. It has two problems. One is it's hardly a, from accuracy perspective. So it's very easy to be better than Facebook. Uh, it's not, not that amazing. It's also very slow in training, very, very slow. Uh, and when we're talking about scale, having, having a system that does the parameter optimization very slowly, it's almost un, un, unacceptable for us. So we use it sparsely. Uh, and whenever we 
try to use whenever it gets in the mix, it actually loses 95% of the time to other models. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is there anything like yeah, the, the imbalance doesn't matter because we are not learning the anomalies. Yeah, we're learning all the normal and supervised too. So in terms of feature engineering, um, for for the time series based anomaly detection. Um, the I'm trying to think of uh, of generic general things. So so you know we we kind of designed it for this problem and based on a lot of uh, a lot of examples that we've seen. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we started, uh, when we started, we. You know, I had one algorithm in mind that I thought would be the first one we implement, and it was the first one we implemented. Um, and and then we got data from a design partner. It was a, two companies in Israel, Wix and Outbrain. They gave us a dump of a lot of historical. I said, here you go, Just play around with it. And uh, and the algorithm that I had in mind was only working okay or what I call smooth signals or regular signals. And initially when I thought about this algorithm, I knew that this is its limitation. It can work on regularly sampled data that is mostly, uh, um, uh, mostly smooth like that. Um, uh, and, and I thought this would be most of the data. And then when we ran it, data sets, company, if we're large enough, we saw that it fits only about 30% of the data. Now, the requirement was all of the data, not 30% of the data. Uh, so, so it was very clear that we have to design, well, either design one meta algorithm that can work on any type of the data. We chose a simpler approach, which is designing lots of fast and smaller algorithms that can work on different types of behaviors of data. And then classifying automatically, yes. So the feature engineering came for the classification part. And once we classified, we had simple algorithm or relatively lightweight specialized algorithm for each one of these. Yeah. Uh, so that's one example. Um, but again, it, I came with the assumption, with a clean assumption that I can live, that most of it is like that. And then you let the data talk and, and you find out. So the tip is to constantly, and 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 then check where there was a and decide whether that portion of the data is important or not. If it's important, yeah, you have to deal with it. If it's not important, put it aside later if you want to. Yep. So so yeah, for for. For some algorithms, we have that. Uh, for the for, for so for the smooth signal, what we call smooth signal, um, we have a few algorithms running there that could work. And for one of them, we have we do have state estimation using Kalman filter uh, to run it. Uh, and it's actually one of the patents is around that uh, because. It was very, very, very slow when we wanted to work on it. Where is it? Yeah, uh, it was very, very slow, uh, and uh, we we couldn't use it. We couldn't use common filters because the estimation part took too too long. Uh, on time sequences of of time series, it could take ten minutes for one time series, in the in the best code that we could find. So we had to redesign the uh, optimization procedure completely, and we turned we went from from minutes to milliseconds on that one. So that why, that's why it's a patent. But uh, we have one like that. Yeah, I think we're uh, way over time. Or
for you guys and it's Friday. I'm sure you want to go home. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, bye bye.